We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is David Murren, global forecaster and author of <laughs> Breaking the Code of History, Lions Led by Lions, and Red Lightning. David, thanks so much for joining me again today. Great to have you back. Tom, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. So, you know, you write a lot about some very interesting ideas, ideas that are maybe bigger, but yet have real world application. So how is the road to war peppered with polarization? You know, those are two themes that we have seen a lot of here. So how do those play into each other? Well, I think let's go back like, you know, a, a step because um, my, I call it the, the, the principle theory of human interactions is what I call human anti-entropy and the theory around it. And it's this idea of, Essentially, how did we, or what is our survival mechanism? How do we survive in this universe, which is entropic, meaning it goes from something to nothing in terms of temperature, energy? So that means, by implication, that literally you need to do something to create a better outcome, mm -hmm. to change, you know, the dynamic, to to shape the world around you. So what ent entropy really is, is it works against us. And every form of living DNA has to fight against the forces of entropy to survive to the next generation. So the human strategy is social structures. There are more of us, therefore we combine. And we created tribes and bigger social organizations and finally empires. And they have coherence where they all work together. And at their peak, essentially, they have their maximum anti-entropy. And if you look at empires thousands of years ago versus today, they have much less impact on the world around them. And obviously, we have more impact, some detrimental through climate change, but many very positive things like technology, medicine, health, they're all those products. And what we've been doing is having wars between a system which is old, aged, sequescent, and a rising system that has more collective energy that then goes to war knocks off the old system and makes a new peak in anti-entropy. That's what we are. The human race has been using war to perpetuate survival by removing the weaker system. We need to understand that because war plays an intrinsic part in our human evolution. And until we understand that, we can't replace it with something different that's less destructive. So the timings of war are not random as I've talked to you before about their position on the empire cycle, whether it's a regional civil war between stage one and two, which lateralizes society and allows it to basically be more adaptive, militarizes it and lets it run down its resource chains and algorithmically build an empire mm -hmm. to the wars of, of almost defense as, as that empire later in decline is attacked by rising systems and challenged. No coincidence about what happens to the dynamics of those wars, but the drumbeat that then regulates those wars is the Kondratiev cycle around the dynamics of commodities every 56 years. And that sort of regulates times of change. So if you have a hegemonic challenge, as we did do in 2010, it was never going to come to a fruition of combat and war until nearing the peak. 22 is about right, actually. Three or four years before the Kondratiev's peak, things start to get pretty difficult and, you know, conflict breaks out. Mm -hmm. so you've now got the system of anti-entropy in human systems. You've got this process of conflict, which displaces the weak for the strong in a Darwinistic struggle. And you've got the drumbeat of the commodity cycle, which then regulates when those wars take place, their timing within a dynamic. And then... Once systems start to come together and decide, for example, you're the hegemon and I'm the challenger, I start to get very aggressive. So wolf warrior diplomacy is the epitome of a Chinese polarization system, which I call a primary polarization. Their expansion is driving their, their polarization towards dehumanizing the other side so they can go to war. And usually the hegemonic structure that's already there is a bit old. It's a bit hubristic, it's quite arrogant, and it's slow to respond as America was. And finally, America starts to produce secondary polarization, which is, well, they're coming for us. We better do something about that. And you're seeing that across bipartisan politics. There's one thing that America agrees on the other side is constraining China and containing China's challenge. Mm 
or that they have other differences. So that's really the polarization dynamic which starts to take place. It's always driven by the primary polarizer because they're expansive, aggressive energy, and then there's a response which is secondary. So, for example, across Europe, we can see um, Ukraine's attacked, and slowly all of the countries on the border with Russia, well, they didn't go slowly, they went very quickly from Finland to Sweden to basically Poland, they realized they're next and Estonia. So they become much more ardent in, oh, my goodness. And further back, you can think of France and you can think of countries in the middle of the of the EU that were completely and utterly less motivated because they had barriers and distance to protect them from the concept. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Japan has become a secondary polarization source because it sees the threat from China in such a way as it's now throwing off the shackles of defensive policies and moving towards a more balanced offense defense which is designed to deter chinese aggression that's all a bit late but that they're good examples of secondary polarization which leads on to an interesting question is why hasn't germany responded with a classic secondary polarization of you're coming for me i need to spend money i need to reinitiate my defense program and essentially get with the program to support ukraine and that's the big question on everyone's lips why has germany done that now, the answer is, I think, bigger than the question in some ways. And to understand it, I think it's worth just having a broad based look at the German empire cycle, because it's intriguing. And it started, you know, with the Prussians becoming dominant amongst the states. And then obviously the challenge with uh, Austria, which identified Prussia, it gave them a win. So Prussia now became an entity. That entity was consolidated with an expansive war against France. And obviously, by the time they went to war in 1914, they were the third biggest empire in the world. They had a big land grab. They had the biggest, big industrial base, rising with America, all sorts of things going for them. Off they go to war. Then they get knocked off their perch by losing. Mm -hmm. They go all the way back down again to the bottom of the stack in a little vault face like Japan did. They then reconstitute themselves with American capital. There's enough national energy to reorganize because the population and demographics are still very expansive. And so then the next thing that happens is up they come with the Weimar Republic. They get set back basically because of 1929, American money repatriates. And then we know what happened with the uber inflation, the rise of the Nazi party. All of this harnesses this innate national energy that wants expression, despite the events which have been impacting them, entropic events. The Nazi party comes along, they reorganize their leadership structure from instead of the high class Prussians to the low base Nazis without the same background. They go and have another challenge. We know what happens. They lose. They drop down again. This time they're reconstituted. Well, I say this time, second time with American capital and they become West Germany. Intrinsically, West Germany was the bulwark against the USSR's army at the second biggest army in NATO, highly capable, well equipped, all the things you'd think about, about the process of anti-communist, anti-invasion from the East. And then came reunification. And reunification we often think of is West Germany absorbed East Germany. But I think actually we want to think of it as overtly that's what happened. But covertly, it was like a reverse takeover because essentially the values of East Germany, pro-Russian, seemed to persist through a body of politicians from Schroeder to basically Merkel. And I wrote about Merkel two years ago saying that actually every core policy she made was destructive to this empire structure called the EU, which is at the center about Germany, and also Germany's prognosis. It was almost sabotaged. And I couldn't really, it was difficult to see every single policy had a destructive outcome. There wasn't one constructive one. And yet German population really liked her. It was the most bizarre experience, the contrast between image, action, and behavior. And there's a whole sequence on the site about, you know, Merkel and how she undermined the, her country and system and accelerated its decline. And then, of course, you, know, you look at Olaf and Olaf is obviously, you know, a progeny of, of Merkel. She's, he's obviously clearly pro-Russian. I think they truly just believe in whether I don't think it's just idealistic either. I'm really suspicious about this. And you know, if I was an intelligence agency, I'd be looking at the at real roots of control through this political mechanism because it feels and looks like Germany has been subverted by Putin. And, you know, as an, as an intelligence officer, we run up his street, you know, as using the old framework around the Stasi of East Germany, lots of tools available. 
But the net effect is uh, Germany is completely and utterly not in favour of creating an outcome that belittles Russia, as we know. Mm -hmm. It's much more than individuals who have a, you know, a, a recognition that Germany caused two wars and mustn't cause the next, or even the fact that Germany is thoroughly dependent on Russian energy, or has been. I think it's way more than that. So the reason why you're not seeing secondary polarization is you're seeing a fraction within Germany that has basically aligned themselves with Russia, but they're on the wrong side of the fence. And I think the rest of the world has to work out what is happening. I suspect the Americans gave them a jolly good talking to yesterday because you could, and I think, I mean, jolly good talking to you would be, you know, a very serious conversation about whether or not, you know, they would receive help if they needed it at certain times. Because the, the next step and their only way out of this is to let Poland and Finland and Spain release their leopards. Um, and I think one of the things that's happened, again, that's really interesting, if you look at the response of the West to the invasion with Russia, it was our responsibility. We failed to deter Putin in his aggressive actions. And if it wasn't for Boris, and I would say Brexit, that facilitated a Boris but a more independent train of thought, no other Western country would have acted fast enough to actually A, support Ukraine at critical moments, and B, to go and drum, bang the drum for the West to come and support and drag America in. So when people say to me, there'll be no benefits of Brexit, I turn around and say, number one benefit, Ukraine's still in the game, and we're not having a war on the Polish-Finland border and not fully directly engaged with Russia. One outcome, big tick, through the independence of thought mm -hmm. with the form of action. The rest of the Brexit conversation is broader, subtler, but that's one very clear thing that I think people miss time and time again. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and Britain's polarization response, secondary polarization was much quicker because it's the only system that I would argue in the West that's actually in expansion. Having had its Brexit civil war, it's really in the second phase of expansion. So systems in expansion much quicker to actually, they're not generating secondary polarization, they're still generating primary polarization. Someone's triggered the same energy and they start to get much more punchy about the response. And that I, that I think explains Britain's response rather beautifully. So that's sort of the panoply of, of polarization in the world we see it today. You know, exactly in that vein, David, how misguided is it, you know, for this, the response from the UK, you know, they're, they're effectively at war with Russia, yet not increasing defense spending. So how misguided might that be? You know, it's one of my biggest bugbears that basically here we are effectively at war with Russia. Britain is leading the charge front and center therefore number one target. Mm -hmm. And you, around the world right now, if you look at defense spending, it's going through the roof. If you look at Russia, you could argue that Russia started at 4.5% of GDP and it's now probably at 13 to 14% and rising. You look at the Chinese and, you know, officially it's 2%, but their purchasing power parity makes that more like 4%. Um, and, you know, at the same time, they don't declare everything they spend. So you can assume it's a big number and getting bigger. Um, when you go and look at Sweden, obviously it's increased its defence budget. You look at Poland; it's now you know seeking to be a, you know, a significant force on the border over the years ahead. Look at the French. Macron last week declared that they were going to go and raise their defence budget significantly. Most importantly, it's not just about money; it's about delivering capability. And they highlighted the capabilities they wanted to deliver. And there's Britain under you know arch linear thinker Sunak, the, who just seems to somehow think there is no need to spend on defence and doesn't understand how years of underinvestment have resulted to the fact that there's a, a lethality problem in our services, whether it's our air forces, whether it's getting 35s without the right, you know, missiles and bomb programs for the carriers. I mean, the idea that our F-35s have to actually go over the top of a target and bomb it completely misplaces the idea that you bought an effective fighter aeroplane because you haven't got missiles which have been cleared to go in the in the bomb base. I mean, it's crazy. There are no air-to-surface systems to kill warships. Everything you look at, and I think it's most epitomized by the fact that Royal Navy was prepared this year, at the end of it, to let Harpoon go out of service and wait five, seven years for a new ship-to-ship -ship missile to come on board for their warships. So it was the idea that our warships could go to sea and wave at the Russians who couldn't get at them with anything that guns, which you know, is obviously not how long-range warfare works. Now, they've obviously changed. They've now got the NSM, which is a Norwegian Konigsberg missile, um, very effective 
you know, intermediate range surface missile about 180 miles, and they're going to put them on the ships. But what a signal to send to Putin to be doing it so late in the game. So I think that that I I do admire Ben Wallace's stalwart support of Ukraine, and you know pushing the boat out within the parameters that he's been given. But right now, I think a defense minister of our country should be standing up and saying, it's not good that we spend 2%. It's not enough to spend 4%. We should be spending 5% in the capital sum and 5% every year until the threat of China and Russia has abated. Mm. And to not do so is a fundamental failure, I'm afraid. Well, you know, you you touched on something there that I want to get your thoughts a, a little bit more on, David. You, you know, we see this process of oscillation whereby parties and electorates choose the next candidate based on the shortfalls of the previous leader. So are we in need instead of lateral thinkers at this time? Yeah, well, look, all entropic environments, entropic being disease, epidemics, war, or natural disasters require lateral thinking to solve, counterattack, overcome. So linear leadership works in times of stability. And if you have a formula and you want to keep using it in a stable environment, linear leadership really does have a place to do that. If you could keep the world stable mm-hmm. and you can speak to God and say, would you stop the, the, the forces of entropy and hold them back, then you'd have a nice linear leadership, railway tracks all the way through. But the moment you end up with challenge and change, you've got to have lateral adaptive leadership from the top to the senior people down. Without it, the system just gets engulfed. And the only thing that protects it there's some kind of innate initial energy that allows it to survive the initial onslaught and then adapt. But that's the issue is I don't think we have time to adapt. And what you're really trying to do is recognize why you have peacetime forces and wartime forces and what that ad- adaptation is effectively. So, David, when when we're taking a step back from that, where are we in your stages of empire decline? You know, that's something that you and I have talked about a little bit before. So where, where did we end up and have we progressed further towards that decline? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are, so so who's decline, what's decline? Well, China's not in decline. China's definitely in the second stage of ascension. Russia is in legacy, right? It's past decline. And the only reason it's mounting this challenge is Putin's ambition, fueled by the commodity cycle's revenues, which have enabled him to get aggressive. America is well and truly in late stage decline. Europe is in legacy and literally just hanging together, waiting for inflation to to rip it apart. And Britain's in a stage of expansion, the only one in the West in that phase except for Britain's not not led by lateral thinking, which will make the most of it, is led by extreme linearity and a system which still hasn't adapted. So it's got adaptation to happen. But the interesting thing too is this national energy quality, which I mentioned associated with rise and low national energy on the fall, is way more than just the quality of leadership because the system itself starts to adapt before leaders do. And with this energy, a system becomes more resilient. I see that resilience in the UK, despite the challenges, despite the fact it's not led to the same level. So across the spectrum, we're just further down the path. China's getting closer to the point where if it doesn't challenge, there's demographics and the India behind it means it's finished. It's either challenged in the next few years or it's done. So, and, and why does China have the jumping off point? Multiple reasons. Reason one is it's created a hegemonic weapon of challenge through its hypersonic weapons and the glide hypersonic warheads on top of DF-21s and 26s. It's got some 1,200 of those, and right now it holds at risk every warship in the Asian Basin. Carriers, destroyers, everything is vulnerable to its preemptive attack. Of course, the Americans, having realized that belatedly, a, a really good signal of hubris and, and arrogance in terms of adaptation, are uh, doing all they can to create countermeasures. Those countermeasures, when they come in, would negate the Chinese advantage. So I don't think the Chinese are going to not use that advantage. Now, like all challenging systems, they're never really ready to take on the hegemon. If you go and look at Germany in the First World War, it didn't really have the Navy it wanted to compete with the Royal Navy. It kind of gave up on that, had a big enough army and was fearful that the French would teach the Russians to be an industrialized military structure and they'd be sandwiched in the middle. So they had to go. And for Hitler, it was very much, you know, he had to go. He wasn't prepared, didn't have a navy, he had some submarines. 
had a, a very effective army, but it wasn't like the best army perceived to be in Europe. But he did have surprise, and they did come through the Den Forest. And interestingly enough, none of his generals believed it was going to work. So you can imagine that was a major roll of the dice. He took, others wouldn't have done. And I say that because all hegemonic challenge takes place under less than perfect conditions. The system isn't ready to do it. It has to do it. Mm -hmm. It gets to its best possible moment, and it takes a leap of faith. So hegemonic weapons are critical. I think something else has happened in China, and that is after 2020 in March, and when the pandemic broke, they shifted from this manufacturing export-driven economy to a manufacturing import demand economy or just demand. So they sort of stockpiling resources. They've got a demand gap, which is why the economy is behaving so poorly. The leverage is obviously weighing heavily on them. Leverage, which people often say is like American leverage, but I'll turn around and say American leverage is a second mound of debt and that happens in decline. Whereas what they've done in China is build a USP capability through that second mound. So, but nonetheless, if they don't deal with it, it'll be a problem. All of those reasons force China outwards. And with Xi's total control, they'll do it when they're ready. Um, certainly before Ukraine, I think China would have been very bullish having seen Afghanistan as Putin was for having a go at the West. He definitely wants to go with Biden in office because Biden is pretty weak uh, by any presidential historical standards. But what is interesting is obviously the West has mobilized in ways that actually have been almost haphazard. But look at the effect it's had in Ukraine. You know, it's literally brought the Russians to a halt, holds them at risk of losing very soon. And that's something that's probably rattled she, being honest about it. He didn't expect that. Um, and he's sitting there thinking, well, I primed the system to go, but I, do I feel confident enough to go? So I'm sure there's a whole debate around that on a regular basis. Go, not go, go, not go. Um, and it will probably get more desperate before he does go, because um, the next part of it is that China can't let Putin be knocked out of office. They can't risk a pro-Western Russian leadership for a number of reasons. One is they become surrounded to the north no longer secure in their land base. Secondly, they need the Russian ICBM shield because they don't have enough ICBMs. Having focus on building rockets with hypersonic weapons to kill warships, they didn't put enough energy into rockets, which are used for ICBM shields. So the partnership of China, Russia, gives China enough umbrella with Russia. Mm -hmm. Without it, makes it vulnerable to the highest, highest form of warfare, which is a full-on nuclear exchange. Um, and the other part is it needs Russia's resources, which would come over land, whereas everywhere else it comes via sea. And even if they were successful in kicking, which I think they could be, America and Japan out of the Asian basin with a Pearl Harbor sort of V2 type strike with all these hypersonic weapons, basically they still got to resource themselves. And, the, and the, you've got to assume that the US Navy and its allies with its submarines will control the sea lines, sea lanes that come in. So it needs overland resourcing to do that. So I think for all of those reasons, the two of them are locked in a strategic relationship. Um, and I'm sure you'll see more technological sharing. And I know we look at Russian technology on the battlefield and find it wanting in so many ways. But we've got to remember they make very effective submarines. And if they share that submarine technology with the Chinese, they'll be hell to pay because suddenly the oceans will be full of submarines that are built at a staggering rate, which are not far dissimilar in some ways in acoustic signatures to our submarines, so sufficiently to change the ballpark in oceanic warfare. Lots of things like that. I mean, you know, the Tuscon or the Zircon, which is what the, the Russians produce as a hypersonic weapon, is not a glide weapon. It's a ramjet weapon. It's a different type of hypersonic weapon. It doesn't have to go into the upper atmosphere to come back at you. It can travel horizontally. And that's relevant because I think one of the first breakthroughs will be dew weapons, which are direct energy weapons. They'll probably go, whoever gets them into space first, which is most likely to be America, that gives you top cover. You can put them to F-35s, maybe bees with their, with their 25 megawatt lift fan. And then you can provide top cover in clear atmospherics with laser weapons. But on a bad day, when the weather's really bad, it's cloudy and it's raining, I think those weapons are highly attenuated. So now you're looking at a ramjet hypersonic weapon coming at sea skimming height, completely different problem one that's even harder to counter. Mm -hmm. So the technologies that have been fielded, if they two sides start putting that skill set together, it continues to put more problems in our way in the West. And I do think we've got a devil of a job even holding our own right now, whatever the outcome in Ukraine, which is a different kind of outcome. There is some good news. 
in this mess, which I think is kind of interesting. It starts with a philosophy of um, war has always been the domain of lateral command, even if you could, in the past, with large infantry formations, make your phalanxes and your columns linear in the way they thought because they just had to act as part of a whole. Um, and whereas at sea, the environment's highly entropic, you know, with just sailing, a large warship is a nightmare. You've got to make the ship work. It's complicated. The sea, there's tide, constantly weather-changing conditions, all of those things. And, of course, you've got to make your crew work in that environment, make it a highly multi-dimensional input to making it work. That's really important because, essentially, sea power and sailing power created the facility for lateral Protestant powers like Holland and Britain to build global sea powers because people that went to sea came from the coast. High ratios of coastline to internal volume meant more lateral rather than linear people by domain and adaptation. And it gave us the advantage of, with those qualities, Holland and Britain became the greatest naval powers in the world sequentially. Mm -hmm. And land powers, meanwhile, were locked into linearity, hierarchy. And so you can see how lateralism begat this new form of global Western sea power. Well, I think what we've seen in Ukraine is something very similar in land warfare. Because weapons like end laws and javelins and man pads that kill airplanes and helicopters confer huge opportunity to do damage to the enemy of individuals or small groups. And because also firepower has become far greater historically, there's a really interesting ratio between the spacing of infantry and the increase in firepower in each war. So more firepower, greater spacing, which means you're much more challenging command cycles unless you use you know direct links. But, also means far more opportunity for small, effective organizations with missile power to create and change the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Now that, if I was in the CCP's sort of seat thinking about how I'm going to take over the world, would really worry me because hierarchy removes individuality and decision-making cycles, whereas basically democracy empowers its members to think for themselves, which means that on the battlefield, you become more lateralized and separate and form more effective. And we've seen that in Ukraine over and over, the lack of adaptation by the Russians in the way they fight versus the Ukrainians who have used the mission command system. You know, they have fought three revolutions to be democratic and they're exercising far greater lateralism in the way they're responding than the, than the Russians can offer them. Now, if I was in, in the CCP, that would worry the hell out of me because it's the same watershed of sea power, lateralization, and a whole society around that construct, meritocracy and ultimately democracy, mm -hmm. actually taking place on land. Well, David, you know, you, you've written a, a recent article about, let's say, people with different disorders, let's say like dyslexia, and the way that they can actually fit into times like this and be a very valuable addition to a team because they think differently, right? Yeah. I mean, I've got this, one of the second theories, human collective behavioral patterns. And I highlight an observation that lateral people in, I, I would postulate, are the leftovers of the hunter-gatherers in our gene pool. Because if you look at hunter-gathering, and there's a really good, if you kind of look at Disney and look at the film Prey, it's one of the Predator movies, I don't know if you've seen it. It's with that Indian girl that fights the alien Predator. Okay. Really worth watching, because when I see it, I see how adaptable a hunter-gatherer has to be to survive seasons, different prey, different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But like killer whales are, actually, in the way they kill each single prey set with different skill sets. So the reason why that's interesting is I think that the next step was agrarianism. And agrarianism is that the predictability of the seasons, regularly feeding animals, regularity, linearity, in effect, is part of that agrarian style of operation. And, of course, it fed more humans, which meant that linear you know, agrarian operators had more linear agrarian children, and the whole lot flourished. And that's where we had the big population explosion in humanity around 10,000 BC at the beginning of that process, the, the origins of agrarianism versus hunter-gathering process. I think the hunter-gatherers then became the warrior caste because killing prey and killing humans was a natural process. And as the warrior caste, they became predominantly the leadership class for a long time, and especially in periods of ongoing warfare, when there was no stability, lateral leaders stayed to the fore. They killed each other, they swapped over, but it kept gestating. And so 
essentially, when you look at kind of where we are in our system right now, the reason why the Western world is so linear is because predominantly America and Europe are in terminal phases of decline. We printed money essentially for you know, 20 years, and printing of money is an artificial constraint towards stability until the dam breaks on the outside. And so we've got a disproportionate number of linear political leaders and business leaders and military leaders, more than you'll ever have in a normal cycle anywhere, just at the time when you have the greatest challenge. And going back to your question, I think the ratio in Western societies is somewhere around 30%, let's say, of lateral people. And 60% of those are probably dyslexic in some form. And there's more and more evidence that dyslexia is the adaptive gene, which probably goes all the way back to the hunter-gatherers. Now, in a time when you know, a dyslexic with a lower IQ, it doesn't do very well in a modern world where it has to spell, like do reports and do systematic things which are boring. But as soon as a war comes, you've got corporal sergeants and junior officers perfectly suited to the task. And, and But you need time for them to migrate. And I think if you went to Ukraine, you'd find Ukraine was a pretty lateralized structure now after a year of war. If you were linear, you've lost your command and probably died. So it's full of lateral people. And I've encountered some of them to verify that process. And so war is one of the most incredible entropic events, forcing human systems to lateralize because the linear leaders just don't adapt and they lose their commands, are shown up very quickly to the speed of change. And dyslexia is one of these key qualities that's underestimated that environments of change and adaptation, that different hardwiring and thinking provides game winning strategies. And there are a number of intelligence services that embrace dyslexic quite heavily as a result of identifying code breaking, different ways of thinking, different ways of strategically operating. And that's something the West is going to have to do on a much larger scale. Somewhere out the back of this, we're going to realize that there are two subsets of the way human thinking operates. And we're going to two educational systems because sending a, a, you know, a lateral person who's got a dyslexic element to a school where they're pre-selected 11 is a freaking disaster mm -hmm. because essentially what happens is I described as a learn to learn program. So my theory is that that form of the brain is creating a three dimensional hologram and putting data points into the hologram and then trying to connect the data points in a way that teachers with a linear teaching process would never even see. So they appear to be slow learners because they're actually reforming the information into a format they can then manipulate. Mm -hmm. And the more data points, more confidence, and also the higher IQ, because there is a horsepower element to this process. Essentially, the further up, and the, they get more and more effective, and they start to challenge the system effectively. And people like Einstein were dyslexic. I mean, he saw the world differently because it didn't make sense the way it was formed to him. So this hologram means that Lateral people tend to keep learning until they drop dead. Whereas, interestingly enough, you know, very often linear people tend to tail off from between their 40s and 50s. And if they're absorbing, they're absorbing within boundaries and tight boundaries. So it's a very different way of thinking. I think we're entirely symbiotic. So I don't want to make the point that one is better than the other. Because if you give, for example, someone a wonderful business and 10 years of steady state, the dyslexic lateral person is going to try and find a way to make it better. It may break it. Whereas actually it works really well under linear leadership, off it goes and it survives 20 years. Mm -hmm. But what we do need to do is identify that we are different within the subset. And instead of fighting each other, because it, there is a battle and you see it in the empire cycle, regionalization is tends to be quite linear. The regional civil war is where the lateral people take hold and depose the linear people. And they then build an empire because they're so adaptive and bold, brave exploration, and they go to the edges. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't build the system. It's the freedom of the people that builds the system. And then as the empire becomes towards the top, of course, it doesn't have any challenges anymore, and things become more stable. So now linear people start to build institutions to enshrine the process so it'll last a 1,000 years and the mavericks become a little bit embarrassing and more embarrassing. And by the time you go down the bot with the bigger institutions, you got rid of all your lateral thinking. And that's when you stop being productive mm -hmm. because your creative energy stops. Number of you know patents and everything else comes to a grinding relative halt. And that's the opportunity of a hegemonic system to challenge at that stage, which goes well, and, to China. And I was going to say, as you're explaining this, you know, especially the the example about war, it's almost an evolutionary forcing function to go back to lateral thinking because you're you're forcing those people in a way to be successful, right? 
Yeah, well, it's okay. Let's look at it. let's look at a system whereby let's imagine an empire where essentially the linear there is no entropic external stimulus now, and you've got rid of you know you're, you're into maturity and overextension. You've got rid of all your lateral people, and there's not a single thing that forces a system to change. Well, it just carries on, but it will literally plateau because it will perpetuate with incremental change rather than quantum change. But what warfare does is means when you're in that state, someone starts to catch you up, you get bumped off, you force the rise of lateral thinking either in the new system or in the old system, and then you have a rise of lateralism, which makes the next leap forward. There was a very interesting piece in the paper I picked up or uh, in one of the journals of science saying the number in the past 30 years of quantum shifts in science and thinking and breakthrough has like dulled to very, very few. And I, it's the evidence I'm talking about of in decline. You just don't get those quantum thoughts and actions. Mm -hmm. And maybe individuals are having them, but they can't plug them in. They're quashed very quickly. They're not funded. You don't see them rise to the fore. So, David, you know, we've spoken a a little bit about your five stages of empire model. And you also have the K-wave commodity cycle that kind of fits within that. So how does that framework work? And, and where are we within that commodity cycle? So there are two cycles. I mean, the five stages of empire cycle is my construct to explain human social systems. The K-wave is a Kondratiev cycle, which a, a clever man called Kondratiev, a Russian economist, picked up in the 30s. And so I just latched on to the, what it really means. Mm -hmm. But it has a great deal more significance when you dovetail it into this top theory. And essentially, Kondratiev's work was a commodity peak every 56 years. And an up and a down and an up into the peak. So three waves and three waves off the peak, down, up, down. And the observation that wars broke out as you reached, reached the top of the peak which fits with the theory of five stages of empire because it's resource driven and the need to have resources to fuel the system, to make the organization work. And that's what we fight over. Humans fight over resources and we use all our ideas like religious constructs or our political ideas to polarize and use the meme to polarize our people, to dehumanize our opposition. And um, so Kondratius, and I followed his work you know, for almost 25 years and latched on to, some, to the wave counting too. The details of those cycles are fascinating. We had the A wave, which was the first inflationary wave from 2000 to 2010, and we'll remember what happened to commodities then. Notably, when food prices peaked, that was when we saw the, the Arab Spring, all food-orientated, inflation-orientated. So you can see how social change comes at the peaks of those cycles. We've had a deflationary period for almost a decade, I think made worse by... In the West, because we've got, or in America especially, a super leveraged system of maybe 0.1% leverage 40 times, the real demand in the system somehow wasn't as great. So the deflationary component of the B wave of a decade was pretty significant, and it ended, obviously, with COVID and the negative oil moment. From that moment onwards, we entered into the C wave, the most destructive, dynamic wave where commodity inflation goes through the roof and essentially it triggers wars in a vicious cycle. We had the first surge up until, you know, a month or so after the invasion. We've been in a counter trend move, which is a wave two of C ever since. I think oil is based, every commodity is based. And what's really interesting about that wave count or that count within the C wave is how central banks have been describing the inflation phenomena. And first of all, they just never saw the surge in the first place, whereas using this model, we were able to predict it. So that's a, a tick in our box, but it's interesting that they're not saying, why didn't we see it coming? Oh, it was a war. And as Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England said, we couldn't predict wars. That's not what we do. Well, we managed to predict a war six months before it. So why can't you learn from that and do it yourself mm -hmm. rather than say, you can't, I can't, no one can, which I just think is, is symptomatic of central banks essentially being controlled by linear thinking in an epic level. The other problem central banks have is their, their asset purchase mechanism, their process whereby, in effect, what they've done is um, created uh, printed money and then tucked it away into another asset-based structure next door. All the central banks have them. Is They made a fundamental error. They funded all of those asset purchases with short-term interest rates. And as interest rates went up, it actually, you know, completely created a gap 
a funding gap between short-term interest rates and the rising interest rates of the long-term debt they held, and the long-term debt started to go down on them, so they have the capital loss. So they're sitting on these bombs. They're all sitting on bombs waiting to go off. The whole idea that MMT is a brilliant, not money printing, is about to come back to roost. And whenever you've got a structure that you you ward or you are responsible for, it truly does tend to cover and, and colour your ideas about what happens in the future, unless you're extremely lateral and, and bold. And so I suspect the whole process has led to this blindness towards the surge. And now I think it's all under control, situation normal, Fed puts about to fund, off we go again to another lovely inflation in asset prices. And to them, I'd say, you need to be watching what's happening in oil or lumber or copper. Mm -hmm. Because if those are wave twos, as the evidence suggests from their price behavior, we're about to see a spontaneous surge in commodity prices, which is going to spike CPA and make you all look like idiots in the central banks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what will happen this year, which means, you know, Danger, danger, Will Robinson, because the wave three of the C wave of the K wave is where wars truly escalate. And one of the catalysts that we haven't factored in is commodities go through the roof and China's need for those commodities just drives its agenda and it pushes Xi through his reticence cliff into action. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.